pretty quickly and leave the vast majority of time for questions. I think that's the best use of our time anyways. Perfect. Yeah, I trust your instincts. Um, all right, so we are live, everybody. So hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's session of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I'm Sarah Provado, and I will be your host for today. Um, and for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is all about bringing um, science, conservation, and adventure to classrooms across the world. And some of you may have joined us last month as we talked with scientists, adventurers, and advocates about um, the prominent problem of ocean plastics. And this month, we are continuing our ocean discussion with a focus on coral reefs. Um, and today, we have eight classrooms um, across North America joining us today. And we are very excited um, to talk with Zach Rago. And a little bit about, about Zach is that he's a youth outreach manager for Exposure Labs um, Chasing Coral Impact Campaign. And he is thrilled to engage youth around the globe through science, art, and passion. Um, Zach is a passionate science communicator interested in developing the next generation of stewards for the natural world. Uh, Zach has been working in the ocean space for most of his career, working with the nonprofit Teens for Oceans and underwater comp camera company, View Into the Blue, where he became involved in the production of Chasing Coral, which by the way, has just won an Emmy. So congrats on that um, amazing accomplishment. Um, he has also uh, experienced working in the aquarium world where he followed his love for corals. Um, Zach holds a Bachelor of Arts in uh, Evolutionary Biology and Ecology from the University of Colorado. Um, so thanks for joining us today, Zach, and you can take it away. Thank you guys for having me. Um, so just a little bit more to start on my end. Um, I am a biologist by training, but my career has taken me in a variety of super interesting places. Um, I've always been in love with coral reefs. They're kind of my great escape. I got scuba certified when I was very young um, and have been in the water my entire life. Um, I had a, a very cool opportunity come about to be part of a film that was ultimately going to show the world what the current state of our coral reefs are. Um, and it turns out that that experience changed my life in a huge way. Um, and I've been able to travel the world and, and go to some of the most remote coral reefs around the planet. Um, so I'm going to start with just a, a short slideshow um, to talk about that experience. And we'll keep it really quick. And then I will open it to questions and we will hear from all of you guys. Let's see. So can everybody see this? Yes? Can you guys see my screen? Yep, it's all looking good. Cool. All right, so I was about 20 years old. Um, I took a gig working at an underwater imagery company in Boulder, Colorado. Um, we built cameras that self-clean. One of the things that we tend to not think about when we think about marine biology is life in the ocean is competition all of the time, and particularly competition for living space. So when you put a clean camera underwater, it immediately gets dirty. And if you're trying to take really nice pictures for a movie, that becomes a big problem. Well, my team was the only company in the world that could fix this problem. And so into my office walks a man named Jeff Orlowski. He previously made a film called Chasing Ice. Chasing Ice was the first visualization of how our planet is changing that had ever really been um, given out to the public. And what he did was he utilized time lapse to manipulate the way that we can interact with processes that may live life in the slow lane on this planet. So the image that you just watched is years and years of time-lapse photographs watching ice melt. And we found that this imagery as a means of communicating a, a much more complex scientific issue was really effective to the American public and more particularly the layman who, who might not have any 
fundamental science knowledge or science background. It was pictures, um, something that you can see and actually engage with. And his idea was, let's take this way that uh, we can look at our relationship with the earth and let's take a look at coral reefs in a very intimate way. And so what we wanted to do was share the story of coral reefs and allow people to step into our world that we get to experience. The idea being using that same time-lapse method, can we take this coral reef right here that looks very healthy and beautiful, document it changing to something like this where they turn white and ultimately document them dying in the long run during these bleaching events. Now to speak very briefly about what a bleaching event is, Corals are very funny creatures. They're animals that have plants in their tissue that build a rock. Um, they're very unusual and they're very good at what they do. The catch is when water gets too hot, those little algae that live in their tissue, they freak out a little bit, they start producing some pretty nasty chemicals and that hurts the coral. And so the coral actually spits them out, leaving behind the stark white skeleton underneath their tissue and they ultimately can die if that warm period lasts too long. Now, nobody had ever filmed this in the wild. In fact, there was only a handful of pictures from a bleaching event that you could Google four years ago. And so we embarked on this journey and I developed the camera system that allowed us to do it. And we um, took the first time lapse ever taken of a coral bleaching event, and this was in 2016. These were the cameras that I worked on. I worked on these for about a year. Um, they are the world's first underwater time-lapse cameras. They were incredibly difficult to build. We ran into many, many problems. Um, and for anyone that's seen the film, you know that failure is at the core of everything that we do in science. Um, failure may seem like a bad thing, but at the end of the day, when you fail, you tend to walk away with better and new questions. Um, and we certainly learned that firsthand when it came to the project. Now, I want to show you one more example of why failure was so important to this project and why it was so important to the success of us sharing the story of coral reefs. This is a graph of past bleaching events. The first one is from 1998, one of the largest bleaching events in the world has ever seen. And then 2002, which was a localized bleaching event in Australia. Now, I'm not going to get too in-depth into the data on the graphs, but what I want you guys to look at is the red areas are areas that bleached very badly, and green tended to do okay. Now this was the data I was working on for the film. And as I think any scientist would, and I hope that you all agree, if you're trying to find a bleaching, you should put your cameras in that lower southern section of the graph, in the southern portions of the Great Barrier Reef. And that's exactly what I did. Unfortunately, in 2016, the bleaching did not bleach there. It bleached almost exclusively in the northern section where me and my team weren't. What we ultimately had to do is make a decision and we left all of my cameras that I had spent a year working on in the southern region and we flew to the north. And instead of utilizing my cameras, we did it by hand. So this right here was my job for about two months. I spent five hours a day underwater and I filmed two minutes of footage at over 50 sites every single day. Now, this might sound like a little bit of fun, and it likely would have been, but I was filming a beautiful ecosystem and an ecosystem that I absolutely adore perish in front of my eyes over this two months. And it was certainly not an easy thing, but what it ultimately did was it told a story. It took the emotions and placed it back into a human story that was oriented around science. And ultimately I think that that's what allowed us to, um, to be more connected in the film was cheering people on, telling the human side of the story of all of the amazing scientists that have given their careers to this ecosystem. 
And what we ultimately did was we got a storyline that was completely out of sight and out of mind. Less than 1% of people have an opportunity to spend a time underwater. And we got this story on the um, New York Times, in Time Magazine, um, in The Guardian. And we gave corals a platform for the first time ever to be talked about in mainstream media. Now, how big was this event that I'm talking about? Um, I work almost exclusively in Australia and almost exclusively in the very remote far north. But that wasn't the whole story. This is a conglomerate graph. It just means that there's a ton of data over a long span of time being represented here. And there's something that I want you all to take away from this. Um, from January 2014 to December in 2016, you'll notice that there is one bar in the key that says no stress. And there is not a single inch of our ocean over the past five years that received temperatures that led to no stress. If you're a coral on our planet, there's a 100% chance that over the past few years, you saw some form of temperature that was warmer than normal. Now, this is a picture from March 2016. This is at the height of bleaching. Um, this is an area that I know very well. And I want to show you a picture from six months later when we went back so I can show you how this structure of this ecosystem has changed. You can see that these corals are not very happy. They're mostly white and angry. But this is what they looked like six months later. One big coral still alive. And other than that, this area is almost completely void of life. Now, the most important thing that I learned through this experience is I'm a science guy. I always have been. Um, I never had a big interest in the arts. Um, I'm not an artistic dude. Um, and quite frankly, five years ago, I probably would have been fairly put offish when it came to being approached about an art project. Um, and I never could have been more wrong. Uh, we live in a really interesting time, and this bridge between science and art is one of the most powerful tools that we have. Um, without it, we can't communicate the enormously complex work that these scientists are doing. And quite frankly, many of the scientists are not good at communicating it. Um, they're actually really bad at it. And so we need more collaboration. We need more people coming together and participating in these projects. Whether or not you're into science, um, whatever your career takes you into, you can participate in work that is meaningful to your values, meaningful to what you care about and what you're interested in um, without having that PhD. Um, I think at this point, it's all about coming together, um, taking a group of people with many different skill sets and creating something that can help change the world. And ultimately through Chasing Coral, I think that's what we've done through filmmakers, scientists, divers, um, you name it, they're a part of our team and, and they made this story happen and coral reefs have a spotlight unlike they've ever had before and we're quite proud of that. And that's all that I have as a presentation. So now at this point I will turn off my screen share and we can go to some questions. I think I got through that pretty quick. Hopefully um, everybody's still around. <laughs> no, you made great time. And what a great way to uh, leave that with that closing message and the simple Venn diagram of crossing over those two uh, amazing fields. Um, so let's get to one classroom that's gonna have to bump out a little bit early. Um, let's make sure that they have their chance to ask a question. Um, so we have Mr. Thwaites class, his grades um, two to fours, coming from St. Thomas, Ontario. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> there was a little bit of an issue with the mic. So any question that you guys wanna ask, just uh, type it through the chat and uh, we'll be able to see it here. Is there a way to unbleach the coral? So there kind of is. Um, coral has what we call a symbiotic relationship. 
So what that means is it's kind of like Nemo and his anemone. Uh, both partners are working together for their own betterment. In corals, that's an algae that lives inside of their tissue. So imagine this, if we were a coral, we would have algae living inside of our skin. And instead of having lunch every day at school, we would go out to recess and lay down and sunbathe and that's how we would get our food. Now, that algae doesn't like being hot. It has to get away if it gets too hot. Now, when they bleach, if that temperature comes back down, it's not super hot anymore, those algae can actually come back and they can sort of unbleach themselves in that scenario. That's a really good question. All right, let's head to Ms. Dodson's class. Um, she has um, a wide variety of uh, students there, all the way to grade eight um, from Massachusetts. And you guys will have the floor if you just wanna unmute your mic. Um, great. You're... Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, my name is Raya. I'm in eighth grade. And what would you have for advice for us um, kids who want to make a change in the world as well? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that you guys are. Uh, the key moving forward. I think that you guys have an amazing opportunity moving forward in your lives because quite frankly, the current state of a lot of the world isn't your fault, right? It's kind of like we threw a big party and now the party's over and the house is really messy and we're asking you guys to clean it up. And that's not really fair. So while we might have to clean up a little bit, what I would say is instead of cleaning the party, I want you guys to throw me a better party. Um, and I think most importantly, that means to find whatever you're interested in. For me, it's corals. Um, and scientists are really cool people because no matter what they're interested in, if you have a conversation with them, they get giddy and really excited. Um, if you come up and ask me about coral, I'm gonna have a big smile on my face, we're gonna have a lovely conversation and I'm gonna be really into it. Some people study bacteria, and you go up and ask somebody about bacteria, and they're going to be just as excited. Um, at the core of science is that we are infatuated with what we do, and we have deep, deep connection and love to our subjects. So whatever that is for you, whether it's lions or squirrels or dogs, it doesn't matter, but follow whatever you're interested in because you'll never work a day in your life. Amazing. That is uh, the way to do it. Um, so we're going to head to Mr. Lavogue's class. He has uh, grade K through fives. They're coming out of North Palm Beach, Florida. Um, you guys, I don't think you guys are grade fives, but uh, you guys are free to ask uh, any questions you'd like. You just have to unmute your mic there. Um, have a little bit of issue with your mic. It's kind of funny you guys are sounding a little bit like rodents right now. Um, so I'm just going to mute that again. But if you guys want to uh, message the question, we can see it through here. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, I guess they'll uh, join back in in a second. Um, Okay, so let's move on. We'll go to... Um... <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, how's the audio now? Perfect. Yeah. Great call on that one. Thank you. Hey, before I turn it over to a student, where, can Zach tell us where he is right now? We like to track where we talk to people from. So yeah. is Zach from Colorado? I am about just, I'm about just as far away from the ocean as you can get. I'm based in Boulder, Colorado. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Charlie, you want to ask a question? No. Somebody needs to ask Someone questions. Else asked. Walter, go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Walter. I'm in that grade. Zach, I was wondering how many coral reefs have you seen work? How, how many coral reefs have you visited and, and where? would you go that you haven't been to yet? Um, so I've done a, a great deal of work in the Caribbean. Um, so my work in the Caribbean has been in Bonaire, in the Bahamas, um, Panama, 
Belize, um, Bermuda. Um, and then the majority of my, my work is done in um, the northern section of the Great Barrier Reef. So I've been lucky enough to dive the majority of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, but by far the highlight of my life um, and the coolest reefs that I've had the opportunity to spend time on is in the Torres Strait, which is the, the area of water between um, Cape York of Australia and Papua New Guinea. Um, it's unbelievably remote. You're very far away from any form of life, um, and the reefs are absolutely stunning. Um, as for the reefs that are on my bucket list, um, those are the very remote ones. Um, Palmyra Atoll is probably number one on my list. That is um, essentially a three-hour flight south of Honolulu, um, dead center in the middle of the Pacific. Um, and then Chagos, which is a old um, British military base um, in the smack middle of the Indian Ocean. Um, both of those places are so remote that they are um, supposed to be impeccable in their health and beauty. Thank you. Okay, we're going to head to Miss Wowchuck's class now. She has grade sixes um, coming out of Thunder Bay, Ontario. So let me just find you guys on the screen here. Um, how deep did you have to go to find some coral reefs? How deep? How deep and um, how deep and how far did you have to go to find some coral reefs? Yeah, so most of my work is pretty shallow, actually. So I work on kind of lagoonal corals, and I don't actually get to spend too much time down in the deep. However, there are corals that actually can go a lot farther than maybe I have. Um, the deepest that I've been in is 150 feet um, or around 38 meters. Um, I guess that's not a perfect transition, but um, that's about the, the depth that I've been at. Um, but most of my work stays pretty shallow. Um, distance wise to travel to them, it kind of depends on where you're going. Since I'm based in Colorado, I always have to travel pretty far to get to a coral reef. Um, but the coolest one, so my work that I've done in the Torres Strait is, um, basically I have to fly for about 36 hours in an airplane, and then I have to get on a boat and sit on that boat for a handful of days until I arrive at the location that we're going to. So it's a ton of distance and travel, uh, but all worth it at the end. But 150 feet is the deepest I've been. And I apologize for the silliness of the American empirical system. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that quick question, guys. Um, we'll come back. We're just going to try to get all the classrooms in first, and then we can come back for more questions, okay? To your class here. So we're going to head to um, Mr. Booth's class. Um, hers has some great fives coming out of California. So if you guys want to unmute your mic. Um, you have the question of uh, the floor to ask a question here. It's Mrs. Booth. Is the, um, I'm from Hi, I'm Lake. I'm from Mrs. Booth's class. Is there a way to tell the age of um, a coral reef? Yeah, so it totally depends on the coral. Some of them you can't really. You can make a guess based on how big they are. Um, but big corals are actually really cool. So you can take a core. So you can kind of like drill a hole inside of the coral and much like a tree. So if you cut a tree down, you can count the rings and find out how old it is, right? That sounds so strange. corals do the exact same thing. They build layers for seasons. And when you core one, you can actually figure out how old it is. The oldest coral that I've been able to see was about 900 years old. Okay, well, that's as old it as was my grandma. Older it was older than Captain Cook finding Australia. <laughs> well, awesome. All right, well, that's old. It's a tree underwater. That's cool. For sure. Great question. 
Um, okay, we'll head to Mrs. Flynn's class. They're coming out of Alberta today. Um, if you guys want to ask a question, um, you, unmute your mic um, and you have the floor. Go ahead, Brent. Um, how many, how many times, how, how many times have you been to uh to reefs? How many coral reefs have you been to? Yeah, a lot. So I kind of mentioned that I've done work on I don't know, probably like ten or fifteen reefs professionally. Um, but as a diver, I've been on well over 300 dives in my life, and I've spent well over two weeks of my life underwater. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll head to Mr. Atkinson's class. Um, they're coming from Virginia Beach. If you guys want to unmute your mic, you have the floor. Hi, my name is Ariella. I'm a 10th grader. And so have you ever gone on night dives? And if you have, like, how is it different from going on a day dive? Yes, yeah, so I have done a handful of night dives. Um, in fact, my first night dive that I ever did, I was probably your age. I was in Belize, and it was one of the moments in my life that actually verified for me, I'm going to work in the ocean. Um, and the reason because of that is to this day, it's one of the most memorable experiences of my life. Um, and that's because it was during the season where bioluminescence happens. And so what you do is you're 60 feet underwater and everybody turns their flashlights off. So you're in the darkest of dark. There's no light whatsoever. And every little movement that your body makes, you put your hand like this and little blue stars and lights sprinkle throughout the ocean. And it was one of the coolest, most amazing things that I'd ever seen. And I knew right then and there that I was gonna continue working in the ocean for the rest of my life. Um, I've also been on some pretty cool night dives in Bonaire. Something else that happens that's really cool is corals like we talked about, are plants and animals. So during the day, they're photosynthesizing and they don't really eat. But at night, that ecosystem becomes a whole nother place. Corals, many of them, can actually kind of flip their tissue inside out and they open up their tentacles and eat all the little things flying around at night. And so the reef looks much, much different at night. Um, and it's very much an alien world. It's kind of like um, even in the terrestrial planet. Um, most things sleep at night and come out to play during the night or sleep during the day and come out to play when it turns to dark. So anytime you're on a night dive, you're usually seeing a much different ecosystem than during the day. But bioluminescence is one of the most amazing phenomenons on this planet. Awesome, that's turned into a great discussion. Um, okay, we will head to Madame Brecca's class. Um, she has seven and eights coming from Chatham, Ontario, if you guys want to ask. Hi. All right, come in. Hi, Zach. My name's Elena. I'm in eighth grade. And my friend Julian has a question. Now that we know that our oceans, corals are all like have like a whole bunch of stress on them, how is that affecting our environment? Yes, that's an awesome question. Um, coral reefs are really amazing, diverse places. And one of the coolest things about them is they're like truly the nurseries of the sea. Um, around 25 to 30 percent of all of the life in the ocean spends some portion of its life cycle on a coral reef. So if we really put that stress on them and coral reefs are getting more and more hurt every year, then we're continuing to put more and more pressure on that 30% of all of the life. They no longer have that space for them to go through, um, you know, kind of the processes that they need to to be happy. Um, so if we were to lose coral reefs, we're directly impacting the majority of the ocean. And that also has kind of indirect causes on the rest of the ocean. Um, 
it kind of works its way up the food chain and ultimately it reaches us. Um, there are lots of people that live in these areas, um, particularly Southeast Asia, where the coral reef is not only impacting the fish around them and the other life that lives on a coral reef, but the humans that make a living off of it every day. Um, so there are lots of repercussions all the way around. What we find in nature is that when you pull on one little string in the natural world, you find that everything is connected. It's a great question, thank you. Thanks guys, we had a great round of first questions. Um, Zach, are you okay to stick around yeah, for one really more good. round? We've got time, as long as these guys wanna go, let's do it. <laughs> okay, um, let's head back to Mr. LeVogue's class. If you guys wanna ask a question, you are free to do so. Okay. Hey Zach, my name is Charlie. I'm a ninth grader here at the Conservatory School in North Palm Beach, Florida. So what was the most intriguing thing about your documentary that made it so appealing to the audience? Um, that's a good question. I, I think the, the most interesting thing for me is coming from a science background. Um, Building an understanding for the power of storytelling, um, right? I'm that kid that for fun watches Blue Planet and is going to listen to David Attenborough. And I and I enjoy that overly sciencey media um, because it fits the bill for what I'm interested in. Um, I think that way. But for the vast majority of people, they don't like that. Um, they don't want talking heads and they don't want numbers thrown at them. Um, it, it's quite frankly boring for the average person. And so I, the biggest thing that I learned is that if you can connect people with the human side of things and, and be more personal and be able to tell a story, um, that's an incredible way to communicate really in-depth scientific concepts without them really even knowing it. Um, I like to think that Chasing Coral is not a very talking heads film, but secretly everybody is watching, they're emotionally invested, and they're secretly learning a ton about coral reefs without feeling like they're learning it. Um, that's certainly something that I learned and, and has um, changed my perspectives a lot. Um, I think the other most important thing more so about the corals is that nothing is black and white. Every coral reef has its own story and there are stories within each of those coral reefs. Um, the Great Barrier Reef is not completely dead and the Great Barrier Reef is not completely healthy and it never will be either. Um, every single location on the Great Barrier Reef has its own story, its own successes and its own failure. Um, and that's the way that we need to think about it because if we bundle them in black and white, um, that's not good. Great. I love where that conversation went. It um, reminds me just that sometimes science um, and learning can be a little bit, a little bit um, too cut and dry. And when you instill that sense of wonder and that sense of storytelling and art, that's when it becomes knowledge rather than facts that are just floating around in your brain. And it's kind of a way to integrate um, learning in a full sensory experience um, to better grasp all the information that there is out there. So um, really great way you put that actually. Uh, so we will head to Mr. Thwaites class. Um, if you guys wanna ask a question, you are able to do so. <laughs> oh, they actually might have already put oh. one in here. How do corals grow? So corals are kind of cool. Um, so the reason behind the corals having algae in their tissue is because of how they grow. Um, the algae uses the sun, it photosynthesizes just like a plant, and that creates a big amount of energy. And that energy is needed because the way that they grow requires a lot of it. Um, Seawater is much different than fresh water, right? It's filled with all kinds of little ions and different compounds, and one of those is calcium. Um, calcium is what things that build their shells out of um, utilize. So the corals use all of that energy and they pull calcium out of the water as well as something else called carbonate. And then they 
build their skeleton with it. So you have a little polyp, which is kind of like a little anemone, and they sit inside of kind of a U-shaped house, and that's called a coral light. It's the, the house of the coral. And they excrete calcium inside that little U, and it continues to build higher and higher and higher. Um, and, and that's how they, they compete for space. That's how they build up to the light so they can photosynthesize more. Um, it, it's pretty cool how they do it. And it's one of the big measurements that we use as scientists all the time is how fast are you growing? Okay, so we'll head to Mr. Boots class um, again from California to ask another question here. You guys have the floor. Can you inform yes, the you the very top? Can you the light? Can you the light? Can you the light? Can you Can you the light? Can you the light? Can uh, and I want to know why coral reefs are so important. Why coral reefs are so unfortunate? Important. Oh, important. Gotcha. So corals are really amazing. So let me put this into perspective. Um, I said before that coral reefs provide a home to nearly a third of all of the life in our oceans. Now that seems like a really large number. Our oceans are huge. That makes up 70% of our planet is ocean. And when it comes to coral reef, coral reefs are less than 1% of the surface area on earth, yet they are home to a third of all ocean life. Now that's pretty crazy. Um, and that makes them remarkably important because they don't take up a lot of space but they are a linchpin for the oceans. Um, and they are also some of the most diverse places on the planet. There's an area in Indonesia, um, actually quite near where the earthquake hit last weekend, called Sulawesi. And there's a reef on that island called Raja Ampat. Raja Ampat is the most diverse location on the planet above water or below water and areas like that are incredibly important because of that diversity because there's so much life there um that that they're very important for the foundation of the the ocean they're a big part of the food chain um and they're a big part of the human lives that live near them Okay, great question. And we will head to um, Mr. Atkinson's class. You guys have the floor again um, to continue this, the discussion. Uh, hopefully you can hear the music. We're in the middle of the bell team. So there's music playing on the speaker. All right, here we go. Yeah, sorry, I don't think I caught that. All right, he said his name's Richard, and we're reading The Old Man of the Sea in oceanography right now. He wanted to know if you've ever read it, and also, what's your favorite marine organism that's not a coral? Yeah, so I have read the book, it's awesome. Um, as for my favorite animal that's not a coral, I feel like I always have to switch it up a little bit. Um, I'm going to give you two. Um, octopus are certainly in that category because they're absolutely fascinating. Um, the brain power in such a rudimentary organism, um, it, it is absolutely fascinating. Um, they see you before you've ever seen them. They're curious. They learn remarkably quickly. Um, octopus are very, very cool. Um, and secondly, it would be dolphins. Um, I've always been a sucker for dolphins. Um, scientifically, they're unbelievable. Um, they're, they're incredibly intelligent. They, uh, they use the same amount of brain power as we do. They use language. They have sentences. They have names. Um, 
they are truly the most human like um, when it comes to language in, on the planet. And um, we just don't know a whole lot about them. Um, all right, we'll head to um, Miss Brecca's class. <laughs> hey guys, uh, if you guys want to finish us up with a question, uh, you are able to do so. Awesome. Oh. Hold on, we're just fixing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, hey Zach, uh, my name's Ava, and we're all really um, interested in the cameras. So, like, could you explain them, like, a bit more, like how you made them, like? Just things like that. <laughs> yeah. So I don't get to talk about the cameras a lot. So thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> essentially what we did. Um, so I'll, I'll explain how the camera works the way it does. And then I'll explain why this project was so complicated. Um, what we do is we have a big glass dome. It's fairly spherical. Um, and the camera system goes inside of that. Now, obviously, when you're working in the marine world, um, electricity and metals and things like that do not fare well um, in the ocean. So all of the electronics has to go interior. What we did is we utilized neodymium magnets, magnets that are extremely strong, and there's a ring of them inside the camera and a little motor that pulls them around. And now we have a windshield wiper on the exterior, which also has a ring of magnets. So when it spins around, it pulls a windshield wiper around and cleans the glass dome perpetually. Now, when you're working as remote as I do, you also have to find out how to power it. So I actually built the world's first underwater solar panel as well, which we don't talk about a whole lot, but I'm still super proud of that. And we had 10 big batteries all put into a Pelican case I then filled that Pelican case up with a bunch of epoxy and then put a solar panel on top. That gave me about three months or so of power for the camera. Now that sits completely remote. It's connected to nothing. It's just connected to a big battery pack with a solar panel. And I have a small computer called an Arduino board on the camera and it wakes the camera up every two hours it tells the camera to take 30 burst images and then the camera falls back asleep. I come back three months later, there's a 512 gigabyte memory card in the camera and I pull all of that information off of it and then we can either recharge it um, or take it home with us. Woo! That's awesome. Good job, good job. Smart. Yeah, super cool. And it was like a ton of fun. However, what if had have, have you guys seen the film? Okay, so go home tonight, watch Chasing Coral. It's easy, it's on Netflix. You'll see that I failed with the cameras a lot. I started in the northern hemisphere and all of my cameras didn't work. And it's because they got blurry. And the reasoning was we had a lens on the camera. And we chose to do manual focus because if we didn't do manual focus, if a fish comes into the screen when I'm trying to take a picture of the corals, then my images would be out of focus anyways because the fish would be in focus. So I ultimately had to manually focus it underwater so that the corals were in focus and then walk away. Now, the way that a camera lens works is there are two rings on the inside one of them is for your focus, one of them is for your zoom. Those, when you're in autofocus, have an automatic lever inside of them that does, it allows them not to move. When you're in manual focus, those rings are essentially free floating. Now, in the laboratory setting, it works perfectly every time. But what we can't test for in the laboratory is the inherent vibrations that happen underwater from massive amounts of water movement, currents, water pressure, all of those things play a factor. And so for the first round of cameras in Bermuda, the Bahamas, and Hawaii, when it was underwater vibrating, those rings slip. 
slowly but surely because of the vibration. And over time, the images get blurrier and blurrier and blurrier. And I walked away with nothing. Um, so if you see the film, you'll understand why that all happened. And again, it's all part of failure as part of the process. Uh, but awesome question. And uh, thank you for asking it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as per exploring by the senior yeah. pants uh, tradition, we will go to each class or and just unmute the mics so we can give the, uh, Zach a big thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Zach. I think we all learned something and uh, you had a great message to, to tell everybody as well. So, well. Thank you, guys. I appreciate everybody's time and it was awesome. Someone else be a hot dog on there. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and uh, join us uh, th throughout this month for more uh, hangouts towards uh, learning more about corals. Um, I will promote one of them. A good colleague of mine is doing one next week. Her name is Dr. Emma Camp. She is awesome. So go listen to her. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Bye.